Hello guys, uh, please note that we are waiting for more participants uh, to join this webinar. Till that time, I am sharing our uh, social media platform link, our communities link and our uh, uh, official website link. So guys, go and follow us on our social media platform for upcoming webinars and workshops.
Okay, let's start the webinar now. Yeah, hi, good morning, everyone. Oh, uh, hello. Uh, good morning and welcome you all uh, in this uh, AZ 400 session. Uh, Archie this said, I'm a host for this webinar. Guys, if you have any question and queries, please put question on chat box. We would help to help you out. Moving ahead and talking about event sponsor that is Synergetics. Uh, Synergetics is an India one of kind co-porting learning solution company. Now you will get a question like who we are and what we're doing. So answering your question, we bruise through our offering and also give complimentary advisory service to client who wish to modernize their framework. Also we educate, advise, implement and manage. Then a Synergetics solution offering that is a Persona based onboarding solution, onboarding add on solution, certification solution, certification add on solution, reskilling solution, emerging technology training solution, certification hackathon solution, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales pre sales training solution, practice playbook solution, and architecting solution. Now, what this Microsoft certification does, it will give you complete learning experience. You will get trained, build confidence to appear for the exam and get recognized. That is get certified. Uh, this is skilling journey. Here you can advance yourself. First, you have to complete fundamental certification. Then you can go with the advanced role based certification, then expert level certification. In this fundamental certification, we are providing you five types of certification that is AZ 900, AI 900, DP 900, PL 900, and SC 900. In this associate, associate level certification, here you here you can see on my screen we are uh, we are providing you uh, uh, this type of certification. Then expert level certification, we are providing you AZ three zero five, SC one hundred, PL six hundred, and AZ four hundred. Also, we have special certification that is AZ120, AZ140, AZ220. If you want any paid certification, you can connect with us. We, I already shared connect details on chat box. So certification will help you to increase your visibility and expand your knowledge and skills. We do provide certification add-on, onboarding add-on like short duration models and more. Then moving ahead and today training is organized and handled by ATC community. So our ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technology and various emerging technology. In this ATC community, we have emerging technology community for all. Then Azure tech community for Punekars, emerging technology community for Suratkars, uh, Azure tech community for Nagpurkars. Guys, you just have to install the Meetup app on your device. There you can follow our communities. <clears throat> then you have to follow code of conduct, which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Please note that participants are not allowed to take screenshot of the presentation and cannot do screen recording. We will try to upload this training on our official YouTube channel. Then today's speaker for this training is Mandra Shinde. He is a Microsoft certification trainer and currently work with the Synergetics as a trainer consultant. Then agenda for this webinar, you will get to know more about AZ400 certification and benefit of it. Then in one day webinar, we are providing you one day workshop uh, which include in study material and more overview of the modules. Then coming with self learning plan, we are providing you learning achievement best. Then maintaining an exam prep session. If you have any question, you can submit a question on our feedback form. Then knowledge assessment. Uh, before end of this webinar, we are providing you assessment link. You can give your exam and test your knowledge. In this AZ400 uh, certification, we are providing you learning achievement badge. You just have to follow the step and you will get the activated badge. Here you can see our upcoming events. Uh, so guys, uh, interested participants can go and register yourself. Uh, please note that registration is mandatory to all of us. Make sure guys you follow us on our LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter and YouTube for upcoming relevant update and uh, events. Uh, Thank you. Now I would like to hand over this mic our speaker. He will continue ahead. Yeah, thank you, Archie. Uh, yeah, hi, everyone. 
very good morning. I hope I'm audible to all of you. Hello, am I audible to all of you? Uh, yes, sir. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, OK, so uh, as you now know me, I'm Mahindra Shinde, Microsoft Certified Trainer for last uh, eight years, and uh, I have been conducting trainings for even prior to that. Anyways, about this AZ400, Microsoft AZ400 Azure DevOps certification exam actually covers DevOps as a concept and Azure DevOps as a tool that help you to implement DevOps workflows and all the other DevOps components easily into your organization for all your projects. So what we will do is here we will discuss first what is DevOps, the DevOps as a concept first, then what exactly Microsoft Azure DevOps or Azure DevOps as a service, what kind of service it is, what all different components do we have, okay, and how it actually help us to automate all those workflows, DevOps workflows. Later, we will focus on uh, two of the modules like uh, Azure Board and Azure Pipeline, what exactly these are, and then we will discuss Wait a second, I'll share my screen. Then we will discuss how to prepare for AZ400 certification exam and all the other details about the certification exam. So what I will do is I will just launch one uh, presentation here. Just give me a minute. So the very first thing here is, wait a second. Yeah, I hope my screen is visible to all of you right now. So very first thing here is exactly what is DevOps that we will try to discuss. What exactly is DevOps? What all different types of DevOps tools are available to us? Then some of the DevOps tools, like some of the tools that we use in DevOps, okay, like version control system, then CI CD workflows, continuous integration and continuous delivery deployment workflows, etc. We will discuss. OK, and we'll see how different components in Azure DevOps help you there. Like, for example, Azure DevOps has a component called Azure Repos, which is a version control system. Azure Pipeline, which is basically implementation of continuous integration and continuous delivery deployment workflows. So we will discuss that and later we will talk about the exam. So let's get started with the DevOps. How many of you know what exactly is DevOps as a concept, conceptual level? Those who know, you can just you know uh, use the feature available in Teams. You can raise your hands. Means uh, there is uh, yeah, there is a button on your Teams screen. You can use that button, so it will notify me how many of you are aware of DevOps as a concept. Okay, fine. That's good. So I can see quite few people have already raised their hand. There are five people. OK, anyways, so out of uh, all these 68 people, I can see around five to six people. Fine, we will quickly go through what exactly is DevOps. It could be a refresher for all those who know what is DevOps. OK, anyways, so let's get started with this. What exactly is DevOps? DevOps is union of people, process and products to enable continuous delivery of value to the end user. Now this definition of DevOps is from Donovan Brown and uh, Donovan Brown is actually uh, one of the important author or a founding author of DevOps. He has written quite few books and in one of his books he has mentioned a definition of DevOps like this. DevOps is union of people, process, product, to enable continuous delivery of value to the end users. So what exactly these words are? Because for some of you, it's a very simple to understand definition and some of you might get confused. So let's 
break it down. The definition, I mean. Union of people. What does it mean? It means in DevOps, we have multiple different people playing multiple different role. And as the name clearly mentions, it is actually a collaboration between multiple teams like development team and the operations team. Now, may, may I know how many of you are from development team and how many of you belongs to operations team, system IT? Can you put that in a chat window, in a chat message? Let's see how many ops and how many devs we have here in this webinar. Yeah, that's fine. You may or may not belong to any of these teams. So Arun, what exactly is your job role then? CRM development, fine. Okay, both. Prashant has mentioned both. Good. Anyways, implementation conversion analyst. Okay, fine. Guess what? DevOps is now not just limited to developers and operations. It is becoming increasingly popular with other streams as well or other uh, job roles as well. Yep. Fine. Azure and Azure DevOps are two different things, Arun. Basically, when you just say Azure, you are referring to Azure, the cloud platform. And when I say Azure DevOps, Azure DevOps is a DevOps uh, product. Uh, actually, it's a suit of multiple different uh, component, which uh, the, the standard common components are uh, Azure repos, Azure board, Azure artifact, Azure pipelines. OK, fine. Yep. That, that's fine. That's fine. We keep doing that in IT industry. We keep changing our role, right? You know, moving from one role to another role. It's very flexible and it's very agile. IT industry is in general. So DevOps is union of people. That means here DevOps is not just for developers or testers or operations. It's for multiple different job role for processes. Now, what exactly are the processes? Please remember, even though DevOps is means we normally refer to it as development, but you can use some of the DevOps workflow for non-development activities as well. You will be surprised to know that or may not be surprised to know that if you already knew this, right? There are some variations now, like for example, people now use DevOps and machine learning together and they call it MLOps, right? DevOps with IT operations, they call it AIOps. So DevOps is not limited to a particular single processes set of processes. It is now expanded to multiple different processes. Now you might use DevOps workflows to just build a project, build and deploy project, which is a standard activity. But many a time it can be done for lot, lots of other activities also. Wherever you need to automate certain processes, right? Whenever you need to automate certain processes, you can make use of DevOps workflows for that. So multiple different types of processes, multiple different types of job role and. Multiple different types of products and the main objective of DevOps is continuous delivery of value to the end user. So we need to our main objective is to deliver a value product or to deliver a value to end users and not just once continuous. Now what exactly it means? Good old days, we used to have a software development lifecycle pattern or software development lifecycle. We call them, we call it waterfall, waterfall approach. Plan everything, design everything, implement everything, test everything, and then release it at once, all at once. That approach no longer works now. For, of course, there are few exceptions, but otherwise, in general, waterfall approach do not apply to most of the products we develop. So what do we do now? Nowadays, most of the software is not delivered in just one single go. Instead, we people split the software development or product development into multiple phases. In phase one, you will deliver a product with certain set of features, functionalities to end user, get the feedback, and then 
start working on the next phase. In next phase, you know, you implement certain more functionalities or sometimes you might have to go back to some of the existing functionalities and change them, twin, tweak them as per the user's feedback. So basically this is how DevOps workflows now looks alike. And this is now kind of, you know, a symbol associated with DevOps. But by the way, do you know the symbol is actually a symbol of infinity, right? So the DevOps is a continuous process. Once you start the process, it keeps running. Like for example, let's take the plan here as the first phase. So you are planning up to build a new product. So what you do, you don't plan entire product. You plan the first iteration, you plan the first phase, or you plan the first milestone. Build it, and then continuous integration. Deploy it, operate it, get the feedback from the customer, get the feedback from the end user, and then integrate that feedback into your next planning, next phase planning. Based on a feedback for from phase one, you will now design your phase two. Now in the phase two plan, there are two things you will be doing. Optimizing some of the old functionalities and introducing new set of functionalities for phase two. So you start the plan, you build it, you perform a continuous integration, you deploy it, again you operate it and again you get a feedback and then you plan for the third phase. This is how DevOps work. Are you getting my point? Hello? Yes. This is an iterative approach. We don't build everything at once. What we instead do is we split it into multiple iterations and each iteration we are doing some optimization. We are collecting user feedback and integrating it into the next plan. The biggest or you can say the ultimate truth about software development is that everyone knows that software is just a piece of code. Yeah, but the level of complexity, people may not be able to understand it. An end user might feel that an end user might feel that changing a background color in, a, in my website should be easy and developers should be able to do that in just a couple of minutes. Right? Even many of you might also think the same way. That doing a small change in an existing code should not take more than a few minutes. But guess what? There are several quality controls. After every single change in your code, your code has to be rebuilt. It has to be tested. And you know what? What all different types of tests do you run? Anyone here from QA background or anyone here who knows in general what all different types of tests? are actually launched or actually, you know, kind of run on your project. Software projects. There are unit tests. There are integration text tests. Yes, Diraj, black box and white box. Those are generic categories, right? Unit tests are basically white box. There are performance tests. There are non-functional tests. There are regression tests. So even though it appears even though it appears that you just have to change your background of your website, but that's not that simple. Yes, the developer can actually change background in a couple of minutes, but then what? You have to retest your application for all these things, and it is going to take a time. So many a time, changing your application is going to take, or introducing any change to your product is going to take some time. You cannot expect, see, modifying a application or changing an application is not as same as making changes to a Word or Excel document. Most of the end user behave or believe something like that. Right? There are so many different things, so many different activities you need to run. Now, what if all these activities are manual? Then apparently a task which can be completed in just five minutes. Your team is taking five days to complete it. Why? because it's not that only task. There are so many other activities they have to run after every small change is made to the code. And what if we can automate all those activities? What if let's say there is some kind of workflow you have designed, right? The workflow is going to, you know, kind of 
launch itself automatically based on change detected in a code base. So as soon as code base changes, it will automatically get the code, build it, run all kind of tests in a sequence. If any of the test fails, give a report back to developer that there is a there is an issue with your recent change. And if no, finally build the project and give it to your operations team saying that this is the product. Now you can go and take this and release it to the customer. What if we can automate all these processes? We can reduce amount of time it takes to release the change to the end user. I hope I'm I'm clear about this now. Any question about DevOps? Yeah. Yes, Anjum, there are multiple different types of tests and for the quality code, you have to perform all these type of tests and if you do this manually, it's going to take a lot of time. Fine. So let's see what exactly is this DevOps definition once again. So DevOps is union of people from multiple role processes, multiple different types of processes and product, multiple different types of products as well. DevOps is implemented for custom user application. DevOps is also implemented for generic or general applications. Like for example, Microsoft used DevOps workflows or DevOps for building their operating systems and general purpose software like MS Office or Office 365, what we call it now. Similarly, there are IT organizations who are building custom applications for their client and they are also using DevOps. OK, so multiple different types of products we use. Fine. Let's move to the next slide. It is possible now because it is an iterative approach. First time when you start using DevOps, your first experience with DevOps may not be good. You may not get it right on the first attempt. So what you have to do, DevOps is a continuous process to improve. There is a scope of improvement here. So first time when you do it, first time when you implement it, right? Like for example, you might find it little difficult to implement DevOps and to move away from waterfall approach to iterative approach. So what you need to do, you have to use a very simple principle, OODA. Observe, orient, decide, and act. Are you getting my point? Hello? Observe, orient, decide, and act. First, observe the things. Now, while you are observing the things, you then need to orient yourself. When you observe, you find some things. DevOps engineer need to know coding. DevOps engineer need to know overall few details, but may not be a developer. See, as a DevOps engineer, you should know what all different programming languages are there, right? And how they're actual means how they actually work. Like Java uses JVM. Java uses a build tool called Maven and Gradle. .NET on the other hand use CLR and it uses a .NET CLI or NuGet CLI, etc. Uh, Manish, you will get uh, a link to the learning material. Don't worry. OK, not the slide. We cannot actually share slides with you, but you will get the link. I'll share the link. OK, so DevOps engineer does not need to be a coder, but he should have a fair idea how many different programming languages are there and what is their basic structure. You need not be a developer. Right, you should at least know what kind of tool is required for building Java application and what type of tools are required for .NET application. Uh, OODA, there is no tool mapped. Observe, orient, decide and act is basically just a generic idea. No, Arun, there is no set of languages that are mandatory for you to know. There is no such thing. OK, but please remember to know a language does not mean you should be able to write a code in it and build it as well. To know a language means you just need to know the tool chain. Like for example, for Java application, you might be using Gradle or Maven. Most of the time, the DevOps engineers I have seen, you know, their knowledge about languages like this. If you look at a source code repository, by looking at few files, 
you should be able to tell whether it is a Java application, Node.js application, Python application, PHP application, what kind of application it is and what tools I may need in my workflow to build and run this application. That's it. Is that clear? Yeah. So it's only limited to that. Individual developer will know more about, you know, these uh, languages. Your developers need to be more expert on given languages, but DevOps engineer himself or herself will have just a very basic understanding of what programming languages are. They. It should not happen that DevOps engineer is clueless, like what programming language is being used in the, pro but even in that case, there could be a collaboration. In Agile, Agile methodology, which is basically used behind DevOps, right? Developers can always, you know, interact with the DevOps engineers and inform them how to build their application. Build and run usually, usually if web, then IIS server or something in Unix it is. Uh, yes, most of the applications nowadays, OSS technologies nowadays, uh, do not use IIS server. They use something like Linux or Unix based HTTP servers like Apache HTTPD, NGINX, etc. Please remember, this is all now operations team expert area expertise. This is an expertise from ops team. Again, same thing. If you are a DevOps engineer, just like you should know basic about programming languages, you should know basic about operating systems and servers as well. Is that clear? You should know that if it is a .NET, ASP.NET application, it should be deployed on IIS. And if it is, let's say, an Angular and React application or some JS application, you should be able to deploy it on Apache Nginx, sorry, not Apache Nginx, Apache HTTPD and Nginx or something similar to that. So you should have a fair knowledge about that. But if you are an ops as system administrator, then you probably need to know how to set up an Ubuntu machine with Apache HTTPD installed on it and make it ready for deployment. That is something ops team will do. So we have three teams now, developers, operations, and DevOps engineers. Now, DevOps, which we are covering here, if you are a developer, you pick the developer aspect of it. If you are an ops, you pick the ops uh, part for it. Yeah, sure, Darshit, uh, keep your feedback. And uh, at the end of the session, when uh, you will be filling up a feedback, please mention this in your feedback as well. Planning session for Linux, okay? Yeah, fine. So you should have fair knowledge about these things. Okay, let's go back to the presentation here. Observe, orient, decide, and act. Okay, this is like when you are driving. While you are driving, you are observing the traffic around you. Orient. What is orient? Many a time, you have to adjust your own speed based on the traffic in front of you. So if traffic in front of you is slowing down, you also have to slow down exactly to match your speed. Now, what happens if you don't orient yourself? You might crash, right? So you observe, you orient yourself with the same flow, maintain the same flow, become a part of the moving traffic. Decide. Sometimes you might have to take a decision. Sometimes you have, you have to might you might have to take certain decisions. Like for example, your lane is running too slow, right? And there is a space available, scope available for you to switch from one lane to another lane. So you decide. And guess what? What comes later? Act. Now what happens? You decide that you will change a lane because your lane is moving too slow. But what if you act? too late. You, you cannot be too late now. So you have to do all these four things while driving. Observe, orient, decide, and immediately act. Is that clear? And you have to do that with DevOps iterations as well. Next is become data informed. Now, what is data informed? What is data informed? OK, data informed means all your decisions should be based on data available to you. Do not take any particular decision 
just because you feel like like it okay so like for example let's say if you want to purchase if you plan to purchase a laptop what you will go what you will do go to a shop look at some laptop random laptops which are there on the on the racks and then pick one which looks nice to you and purchase it no you know what many of us do we take a informed decision what is informed decision means search for multiple different available laptops on internet do a little study like what cpu might be good for you what configuration might be good for you and after you do all your study then you go and purchase many of you do that right this is called data informed decision isn't it correct then strive for validated learning now what is validated learning what is validated learning whatever new learnings you have get it validated now validated learning means you can actually plan some kind of code reviews for developers for example get whatever you have learned get it validated from your team okay please remember one thing just because some activity some task you did certain way it worked without any kind of error that does not mean that it is the best way to complete that particular task there might be some other ways to do the same thing right so get your knowledge validated whatever you have learned get it validated to shorten your cycle time maybe when you are on your first devops project it took you longer time to implement a small task but maybe in future it will be lot more easier like operations team now many people here said they are from operations so i will give you an example from operations perspective in operations guys basically on linux or windows when you have to do a particular task repeatedly again and again you know what you will do you will create either a powershell script or a shell script to do the same task in future right and then in future when you have to repeat the same task instead of writing all the commands yourself you will just go and invoke the script and pass some parameters how many of you have done this any kind of script to you know kind of do the same task over and over again and again yes chandra shekhar has done it good right so this is what shortening your cycle time so now a particular implementation a particular let's say iteration or sprint you were able to complete five different tasks in one iteration in future you will be able to complete eight or 10 different tasks in the same amount of time right so this is called shortening your cycle time and optimize validated learning now earlier you were striving for validated learning now you optimize your validated learning right please remember earlier to learn it took you let's say 2 hours now you should find a ways to optimize it further how to quickly learn there is actually one way to learn quickly define your scope what is it define your scope like for example let me give you an example of a very versatile language called python do you know that python is used for multiple different types of task you can use it for application development you can use it for system administration on linux machines and you can also use it in data science but when you are when you start learning python you define your ultimate goal that i am going i am learning python for app development i am learning python for data science i am learning python for system administration you define a scope and then you start learning it am, am i am i clear hello yes right so define it optimize the validated learning you will have to actually you know kind of learn in such a way that you have to first define what is going to be your scope and how you can quickly learn things okay what is the limited scope you do not have to cross beyond that limit and explore others like for example a very common scenario that happens with people when they start le learning cloud they want to learn everything on cloud guess what every cloud platform like microsoft as of now has thousands of different types of services and solutions available on their cloud platform 
And you can't just go and learn everything, right? You have to define a scope. So you can optimize your learning by focusing on certain aspects or certain things that you need to learn and eliminate those which are irrelevant for you. So optimize it further. Identify how and how more efficiently you can learn. So please remember, initially DevOps is going to be a challenging for you. It might take little longer time, but then over a period of time, there is a scope for improvement. DevOps workflows. In DevOps, the, the, the most commonly, uh, you can say discussed or most popular workflows in DevOps are continuous integration and continuous delivery. Now, what exactly is continuous integration and continuous delivery? Number one, the term continuous here means it's a never ending process. It will keep repeating itself over and over, over and over multiple times. That is continuous. Integration, integration is a complex workflow whose main responsibility is to get the change, to pull the change made by the developer, right? Merge this change into the main branch, right? Run some kind of test, run the product build. By the way, if you want a very simple definition or objective of continuous integration is to verify that whatever code change has happened, right? The code change is not breaking the product. It should build successfully. It's not introducing any new defect, right? That is another objective. It should be defect free and it should be a quality product. So ensure that whatever code change has happened is not breaking the existing functionalities, is not introducing any kind of bug, and it is a quality code. It is not a sub quality or it is, it is not a uh, suspicious code or it's not going to increase your technical depth. So verifying that is continuous integration. On the other hand, continuous delivery assumes that you already have done continuous integration and your application is now ready for deployment. That is continuous delivery and deployment. What do you do in continuous delivery and deployment? Take the already built code, put it on one server, run some kind of test, mostly back black box test. Okay, like for example, you want to test your application for performance. You want to test your application for security penetration test, pen test, what we call it, right? Stress, load, and all other types of tests, UATs, etc. And then finally, after all these tests, when application has already gone through all those tests, then you finally go and deploy it into production. That is what we do in continuous delivery workflow. Any question about delivery and integration workflows? Yeah, sure. So basically, what is continuous integration? Continuous integration is a process of validating the code changes. Whatever code change has happened, the code is not introducing any kind of bug. It works fine. OK, and it is a quality code. To check and test the quality of code change is the responsibility or objective of continuous integration. Continuous delivery, on the other hand, is to Take the application which is already built by continuous integration workflow, run a few more tests on it, mostly the black box one, and then finally deliver it to end user. So continuous delivery, main objective is to deliver the product to the end user, continuous integration to eliminate any kind of issues with the code, right? Make sure it works, okay? And it is a quality product. 
That's why there are two different workflows. Okay. Now, for implementing continuous integration and delivery, we have something called Azure Pipeline. We do that with Azure Pipeline. Okay. Okay. Now, next one is version control. Now, version control is important part of, of DevOps. Actually speaking, you might use version control with or without DevOps. It might be possible that your organization, your team is not into DevOps fully, but there are certain things they are already using. Now, what is version control? Version control means maintaining multiple versions of the same file for the future reference. So it's like if your developer messed up something, okay, wrote some code that actually is breaking and you want to quickly go back to the old working code base, you should be able to do that because you have maintained multiple version of the code and you can always go back to the old working code. That is one aspect of version control. Or another aspect of version control is branching. Branching means you gave one branch to developer one saying that, hey, developer one, you will be working on feature one branch, while developer two should be working on feature two branch. Now, both the developers are working on a different branch. Right? So they will have their own copy of code and they can continue working without affecting the each other's code. Now, Manish has put a question here. How do we reduce tech depth using CI CD? Tech depth or technical depth, you need to integrate it in CI workflow, continuous integration workflow. And there is there are tools available that will actually scan your code base for technical depth. One such tool is SonarCube. OK, you can use SonarCube to scan your project for any kind of uh, technical depth. It will give you a number like you have technical depth worth eight days or eight months like that, and then you have to work on it. Rebuild your code and in next iteration, Sonar will again check how many technical depth is now there. So there are tools available to do that. Next question from Kirit Shah, which good version control tool? There are plenty of them. The one which is very popular with DevOps nowadays is Git. Git is a version control system, a distributed version control system, which is you can say a default one becoming a default one in most of the DevOps tool. There are other version control systems also available, by the way. Yeah. Then Agile or Lean. Now Agile is basically a product development approach. Agile or Lean are basically product development approach. Agile will define how you are planning, how you are planning to build everything. Uh, sorry, how you are planning to build the product. There are Kanban dashboards. There are tools like Trivio, Jira, GitHub projects, or Azure Board. They are all planning tools. Is there anybody who has used any kind of Kanban or any kind of planning tool, Agile tool, Jira, or something similar to that? Anyone? As your board, OK, good. Samir. Sumit, sorry. Yeah. Change point, OK. Jira, Rally. OK, whatever tool you might use, but one thing is very common. They are used for product development. Atlassian Jira, yes. Good, more than one. So they basically allow you to plan your work properly. OK, so these are the tools. Azure DevOps also contain a tool called Azure Board. Uh, Git is the version control system, not the agile uh, product management tool. Okay. Fine. Now, other tools that you we use uh, frequently with DevOps are monitoring and logging tools. Please remember DevOps is Dev and Ops. So it's not only about development, it's also about operations. And you know what you need for operations? 
a proper monitoring and logging tools are needed. Now we have lots of ops people here, so can anybody explain what is need or why do we need a proper monitoring tool or a logging tool? Yes, anyone? Monitor to check if any breakages. Logger can highlight the defect. Yes, that's right. Please remember monitoring and logging is required for application and infrastructure both. They will help you to later troubleshoot the issues if there are any. And this will also help you to set up something called proactive monitoring instead of reactive. Reactive means issue occurred and you then went into a firefighting mode. What is proactive? An issue occurred, your monitoring tool no, notified you that there is an issue. So before your end user goes back to you, comes back to you saying that there is an issue with application, you reply to your customer saying that, yes, we have already identified that issue two hours back and we are currently working on it. Are you getting my point? That is proactive. So monitoring and logging, if you have a right set of tools, will allow you to proactively maintain your application. Is that clear? You know what is a best case scenario? Best case scenario is end user never ever, you know, feel any kind of disruptions or any kind of issues with the application at all. Why? Because your team is able to capture all those issues, those concerns, those breakages or those downtimes even before end user can notice them and start working and fixing them. Are you getting my point? Yeah, what is logging by the way? Logging is a way of maintaining log of everything. Log of everything means it depends. Operating system logs, application log, infrastructure logs, right? What is benefit of all these log maintenance? Whenever something bad happens, you can always go back, right? You can always go back and read the log to understand what went wrong. It will help you for troubleshooting. Many a time it happens that by the time an issue is actually notified or issue is actually, uh, a ticket is actually raised by concerned people that something is broken or something is broken or something isn't working fine, right? How do you do a troubleshooting then? You, you need some data, right? And you can look for that data in the log. Many applications also generate quite a big amount of log. So you should go there inside the log and see what, what went wrong. So that's why monitoring and logging. Next thing you need is cloud. Why do you need a cloud? Any idea? Cloud, whether it is public or hybrid, cloud makes or cloud provides important features like scalability and elasticity. Scalability means cloud provides easier option to scale everything up and down on demand scaling. And what is elasticity? How easily you can operate cloud. Some cloud platforms provide you web console, login, manage your resource. Some provide CLI, write some command to manage your resources. Okay. Some provides third party automation tool support like you can manage your resources using something like Terraform, for example, right? And some mm -hmm. cloud provide all the three, like Microsoft Azure provides you a web-based console for managing your resources, cloud resources, provides CLI, and also support Terraform. So you have multiple ways to manage your resources, and you can just pick which one is better suited for you. Not everybody will use Terraform, not everybody will use CLI, and not everybody should use web console. Rather, there are people who use multiple. 
I might be managing certain resources using Terraform, certain other resources using CLI, and rest of them using Portal, the web console. I can use all three. That is the elasticity. How easily you can access, how easily you can even scale. You can set the availability and all. So DevOps is more and more growing and adapting cloud. But that does not necessarily mean that DevOps is only for cloud. DevOps can be used for on-premise applications and infrastructure as well, but cloud is becoming more, uh, you can say, popular because of the scale it offers. Cloud provides a bigger scale. Now for operations people, DevOps has another interesting concept called infrastructure as a code, IAC. Anybody here heard about infrastructure as a code or any certain tool that uses infrastructure as a code? OK. Yes, ARM template, uh, ARM template or bicep template. These are examples of infrastructure as a code. They simply allow you to describe what you want in a document instead of using commands or instead of using point and click. Describe it in a YAML file, in a JSON file or in a special format called bicep and then use a tool to generate it. Or you can use third party tool like Terraform. Terraform is infrastructure as a code tool. Ansible, on the other hand, is configuration management. But yes, with certain plugins, you can uh, take uh, 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 use it for infrastructure as a code as well. Okay, so define your entire infrastructure is in a, in a document, right? And then use a tool that will read a document and set up infrastructure as you need or as per your requirement. Then. Application environment or architecture called microservices. What is microservices? Microservices application architecture or an architecture pattern where instead of building one single application does, that does everything, we split it into multiple independent applications. We don't call them applications, we call them services, rather microservices. Each service will take care of one certain set of functionalities and it will just do that. And then multiple microservices will talk with each other, right? That is microservices. Any question about these two infrastructure and microservices? Anyone? OK, good. Example of micro and monolithic. OK, uh, basically microservices. I'll give you an example now. Amazon e-commerce application, Amazon.in, right? Amazon India, for example, a big e-commerce platform. For you and me, it looks like there is a website, Amazon.in, where you can just log in, right? You can be a vendor who sell products or you could be a buyer who purchase products on Amazon. For you and me, it might look like a one single application, but guess what? It is actually made up of multiple microservices. 
there is an independent microservice that takes care of simply filtering products, finding products, providing product detail, or providing product search feature. There is a different service that is used for billing and invoices. Another service that takes care of delivering the product. Are you getting my point? And for user or product feedback, there is a different feedback service. So there are multiple services taking care of one particular feature at a time. And entire front end is a separate application. So that front end communicates with all those microservices. OK. Monolith, on the other hand, one example of monolith, by the way, like for example, your Windows operating system is a monolith, one single big product that you need to install. Are you getting my point? Yes. Monolith are one single application that you install and forget about rest of the thing. It has all the required component inside it. But guess what? In monolith, if you need to make any change to monolith, it becomes difficult because that change might have a bad impact on other components, which are all tightly coupled. Microservice, on the other hand, if one of the microservice you need to update, you should be able to do that without affecting others. Are you getting my point? That is one interesting aspect of microservice. You can independently update. You can independently scale. And you can independently create and delete microservices. Without affecting other services. OK, so that's the benefit. In case of monolith, any small change, you have to modify entire solution. In case of micro, microservices, you need to modify one microservice. Just go with it. Modify that microservice only. No need to update anything in other services at all. Independent development. Even their CI CD pipelines would be independent of others. Next, we are discussing here are containers. What are containers? Containers are next in evolution after virtualization. What are containers? How many of you have heard about containers, by the way? Yeah. Just a couple of minutes back, somebody asked me a question like, to be a DevOps engineer, do I need to know about programming languages? And I mentioned that you need to know basic about programming language, like what all tools to be used to build the project and everything. Right now, what about an approach where as a DevOps engineer, you do not have to, you don't care what programming language was used. What if your developer can give you a kind of generic application package? a kind of generic application package where irrespective of technology use, irrespective of build a tool use, irrespective of programming language use, you will be using same commands or same approach to build and deploy Java, build and deploy Golang, build and deploy .NET, and build and deploy PHP and Python applications as well. Is it possible that all of them can be packaged as the same thing, or can we have some kind of a generic package? A small paper box. You can put anything into paper box, you know, uh, apply stickers, pack it, and send it for delivery without worrying about its contents. Are you getting my point? That's what containers are. So, what are containers? A generic wrappers or packaging for your application. And what is there inside the container now? All the dependencies, even the language runtime, yes, check. All the third party dependencies, check. Do you need any OS package for that? What do you want? Busybox, check. You want Windows Nano Server, check. You can include all that. So, container will have everything for your application inside it. Now, just run the container and your application will run. You do not have to worry about how and when to run it, it's already there inside that package. Now, Manish has posted one question, which protocols are supported by microservices? Manish, there are multiple different protocols supported. Rather, microservices do not care what protocol you have chosen. But yes, there are certain best practices. Best practice number one, microservices recommend, microservices recommend 
indirect communication. Indirect communication means like, for example, communication via message broker, asynchronous communication via message broker. So one service will send a message to message broker saying that, hey, message broker, I want you to send my message to the other service, order service, right? Okay, so message broker will accept the message. Now, next second, order service will come to message broker and ask message broker, hey, message broker, do you have any messages for me? And message broker will say, yes, I got one message for you from the product service. Take this and then that service will process. So there is asynchronous communication protocols which are very commonly used by microservices or they are considered best, best practice. OK. For direct communication, you should use something like REST, RESTful APIs, which is stateless protocol. OK, yes. And other than that, there are a lot many different protocols available nowadays, like Golang has uh, GCP, right? Uh, Java has RMI. RMI is something that you should avoid. Instead, you should use more generic like REST because RMI is only for Java. Both the applications communicating with each other must be Java application if you want to use RMI. But what about REST? REST service. Applications communicating with each other may or may not be Java applications. They could be different. Like one application is Java, other application is Python. They still can communicate over REST. Is that clear? Now back to the containers. So containers are generic wrappers where we can put everything. So things become so easy now. You are a DevOps engineer. You need to build an application, right? Ask your developer. Hey, developer, you build the application. Fine. Now do one thing. Just one thing for me. Create a Docker file and keep it in your source code repository. What I will do as a DevOps engineer. I will create a workflow which will take that Docker file and build your application as a container image. Now I don't have to worry about what programming language you are using. Is that clear? Hello? Now, let me tell you what is what kind of issues we are solving. Let me give you one example that I have experienced first time. There was a developer who was building a Python application and he simply informed operations people that uh, yeah, I will answer your question, Manish. Just a minute. So what happened is developer simply informed rest of the team members that he is building application in Python. His application was built in Python 3.5, but the Linux server, which was prepared by Ops team, had Python 2.7 installed by default, right? So operations team member didn't check the version number of Python. He simply said, yes, Python is installed. Then when the code was actually launched, it gave lot of syntax error. Now, after looking at syntax error, Ops team simply blamed it on developers saying that, see, there is syntax error. That means you didn't check your code on your machine. And developer replied, but it worked on my machine. Later, when we investigated, we found that developer is using different Python version and the server is having different version of Python. So this type of conflict can occur. Now Docker will solve that for you. Now you don't even have to remember whether it is Python or Java. There was a Docker file prepared by developer. Yes. OK, fine. So if it doesn't build, tell developer that there is an issue with your Docker file. If it builds, take the application and run. Uh, yes, Harvinder. Uh, microservices can communicate with each other directly using REST API or other protocol and they can also talk with each other using message broker. You have to set it up, by the way, message broker. It's not by default available. You have to set it up. What is benefit of message broker communication? It is called non-direct communication. So one service is sending a message to another service while that service is down. It's not up and running. So message will stay with message broker. And as soon as the recipient service starts up, go to the message broker, get the message, then it will start processing it. Is that clear? Hello? This will create a loose coupling between them. Is that clear? Okay. 
Does packaging uses multiple dependencies, so increasing instance on the same host machine? Manish, that is all part of containerization. When you build a container image, you have to make sure that your target image is made for particular OS. You will have to build an image for Mac if you are planning to build it on, run it on Mac. Sorry, there is no separate format for Mac. It is CPU architecture actually. For OS, you will have to build a specific one for Linux and specific one for Windows, right? Most of the containerized applications are actually Linux application, more than 80% or more than 90%. So you don't have to worry about those choices. But yes, while building an image, you have to make sure that you have packaged everything inside the container for a specific host OS or for a specific OS only. If you have built a container for Linux, it will run on Linux. Yes, containers are build packages, but they are generic. That means once you build them, you do not have to worry about whether it is Java or .NET application because inside the container, you have everything inside it. Everything means it even basically knows how to even launch the application. A Java application might be having a command entry point Java space jar space application name. .NET application might use command .NET space run space DLL file name. PHP application might be using command Python space run server space app.py. Something like that might be already there written by the developer. You just have to run the container. Okay. So it's a build package. So instead of building a jar file DLL file, you build a container image. Okay. So that's about the containers. So containers are next in line after virtualization. First was virtualization. We used to prepare everything in a VM and then we used to take the VM from one place to another place. Now instead of VM, we use containers. What is advantage? When we talk about virtual machines, VM, please remember for a VM, you need to allocate CPU and memory or in general, you need to ask allocate system resources to VM, you have to take into account certain amount of system resources will be consumed by operating system, guest operating system inside the VM, right? Whereas in case of containers, containers, whatever memory or CPU or whatever resources you allocate to container, all the resources will be given to the application inside container. Is that clear? Yes, so resource consumption for container is extremely less. Other thing is containers start and stop pretty fast than simple virtual machine. Why? Because when you start a virtual machine, it has to first start the operating system inside it and then application. For containers, there is no OS, so it will simply launch your application directly. Okay, fine. So as you said, Linux Docker container will be hosted on Linux OS. Yes, Ritesh, that's exactly right. Linux containers will be hosted on Linux machine and Windows containers should be hosted on Windows machine. Containers are not OS portable. Okay, so if you build an image for Linux, you have to run it on Linux. Okay. but 
look at the other side. Most of the applications that you will be building would be targeted for Linux. Share of Linux on cloud or in general in production environment is much higher than other operating systems like Windows. Okay, we'll take a break after five minutes. Now, yeah. Now DevOps journey is very, you know, difficult to start, but later it becomes comparatively easier. Later on, it will become easier. So what exactly are different approaches here? So as you can see here, Agile development approach is different than the traditional waterfall approach. Let's compare them one by one. In waterfall approach, you define, you analyze, you build, you test, and then you deliver. And unfortunately, you cannot go back to the, to the previous step. Like after you define everything and start analyzing it, you should not go back and redefine things. If you do that, it will impact your overall schedule and it will increase the product cost. Similarly, the, the more further you move away, and if you have to go back, like for example, you were running some test, you were in test phase, and now you discovered that you need to redefine something, and you go back to the definite defining stage, first stage, it's going to change your timeline, your schedule, and the cost. Hard to accurately define requirement which can change over the time. If you did not define the requirements correctly and continue with analyzing, building, testing, and deliver, it might create a big trouble later on. And it cannot accept any change request. That means once customer has finalized all the requirement, you started working on it, and then customer came back saying that, now I want you to modify certain functionality. Now it is very difficult for you to implement that change now if it is waterfall. On the other hand, agile is easy. It actually emphasize or it actually encourage change request. How? You implemented first iteration. At the end of the first iteration, you gave some working product to the customer and expect them to provide the feedback. Customer gave you feedback, like they didn't like some, some certain feature and want you to modify. Yes, you accept it and you incorporate it in the next iteration. OK. OK, so agile approach on the other hand. Encourage uh, end users for the change request. Accept the change request for them. So if let's say on Linux based machine, if one has to host ASP.NET application, then one has to host a VM and on that VM we can have host. Uh, not exactly Ritesh. On cloud, there are certain services available which allow you to directly deploy a container. No need to create provision a VM. Like uh, in Azure, we have something called Azure Container Instance. OK or Azure Container App. You can skip the VM creation and directly build your application and run it, OK? Now, so Agile is very flexible. Development methods are based on releases and iterations. Yes, even on Linux. Uh, ASP.NET application can be hosted on Linux because the current version of .NET, we call it .NET Core, .NET Core, C-O-R-E. .NET Core is already compatible with Linux and Windows both. OK. So if you build it as a Linux container, 
it can run on Linux host machine. So at the end of each iteration in Agile approach, you have a fully tested working piece of code. And it focuses on short term outcomes, not the long term one. Agile means build now certain set of functionality and deliver it to customer and get the feedback. Does ASP.NET container run on core.NET and how DevOps help? DevOps will help it to automate the stuff, building the application, containerizing it, pushing it to container registry, right? That can be implemented in CI workflow. And in CD workflow, your workflow would be like this. Set up a test environment, pull the image, run it in the test environment, run some test, and if everything is fine, deploy it on production like that. And by the way, please remember .NET the legacy version of .NET, which was Windows only, is no longer continued by Microsoft. Yes, so Ritesh, if you have such legacy .NET project, you have to then build a Windows application, .NET 4.8, right? Then you have to create a Windows container for that. You have to build a Windows container for that, and it will run only on Windows machine. As your container app, I have to check the documentation, uh, whether it supports Windows container. OK, any question about it? Anyone? Because I'm feeling we should take a small break here. It's 11.21 now. Just a five minutes.
OK, I'm back now. I guess uh, we can continue. Paula back. Yeah, let's see if we have any kind of uh, uh, questions in here. Yeah, agenda, right? See, what we are doing here is uh, today we are discussing Azure DevOps. First of all, Azure DevOps, what exactly the tool is, and then we will discuss AZ400 exam. A CI CD code can be asked by interviewer in interview. See, basically, interviewers, as far as I know, uh, never ask you direct code implementation, but they might ask you a question about how the workflow basically work and what are the different ways you know you can set up CI CD workflow. Okay, so mostly people do generally ask a direct code based question, but that differs person to person. OK. Yeah. Uh, Harbinder has written, we are building deploying 4.8 framework legacy and .NET Core application with CI, CD and Jenkins. Just want to know how DevOps help us to improve the product delivery as a developer point of view. Uh, so Harbinder, you are already using a DevOps tool. Jenkins is also a DevOps tool, but Jenkins focus only on the CI, CD aspect. On the other hand, Azure DevOps has multiple different components in it. So it is more like Azure Pipeline, which is part of Azure DevOps. It's similar to Jenkins. They both do CI CD. So you are already implementing DevOps if you are using Jenkins. OK, only benefit is in Azure DevOps, you get multiple services at one single place. You get Git repositories. We call them Azure repos. You get CI CD. We call it Azure Pipeline. We get Azure Artifact, right? Where you can keep your .tll files, build artifacts for later use, right? And so on. So from the developer point of view, it will be like every time you as a developer make any small or big change in the code, your CI CD workflow, CI workflow uh, basically will automatically execute and let you know whether whatever you have built is perfectly fine or it has any kind of issues. So you can fix them if there is any issue found. It will ensure that your code is a quality code for the developers. OK, see, you know, developers don't like it when they get late kind of feedback. Let's say, for example, you have already done implementing feature one and now you have started working on feature two and you are about to complete feature two. Then somebody comes back to you and say that your feature one had some bug and you need to fix it now. Right? Developers won't like this, but they would like the instant feedback that CI CD workflows give them. Is that clear? OK. Yeah, right. It is asked. OK, fine. So basically, if it is uh, means if you are talking about interview questions, right? Person to person, it does differ, right? My point of view would be directly asking code based questions could be done only if you are interviewing for a particular technology, like if it is, uh, let's say, an interview for Jenkins, then obviously they will go and ask you code based question like how will you build an application or container image using Jenkins file? But if it is about generic DevOps, then most of the concepts, uh, most of the things would be based on use cases and scenarios. If it is a product based one, you might get a question like that. We can run test cases as well. Yes, you can run test cases as well. Rather, Azure DevOps has a tool called Azure Test. OK, so there is a test suit also available where you could run test cases and you can, by the way, for basic tests like unit test and integration test, you can integrate it in your DevOps pipeline, CI CD pipeline itself, CI pipeline basically. OK. Yes, DevOps basically internally use a lot of automation.
OK. Uh, I can't read your name, F-N-U-L-N-U. Uh, basically, your focus should not be on which particular uh, role will give you bigger scope and higher salary. It all depends on how well you can be aligned with that particular scope. Please remember one thing, not all people are equal. You might find it you know, more comfortable. If you are more comfortable as a developer and less as an administrator, you cannot just uh, go and pick administrator role just because they are paying high. I'm just giving you an example. I'm not making a general statement that administrators are paid high. OK, don't make certain assumption like that. But my point is. You will have to identify what scope or what kind of role is better suited for you. Now, if you have done Microsoft administrator, right? Learning DevOps and continue with M365, both will be equally helpful, right? DevOps also isn't currently in a demand, but under DevOps, there are a lot many different types of tools you have to explore and you will have to check which one you are more comfortable with. Start with DevOps, start with M365 and then decide which one is more comfortable, which one is, you know, comparatively less challenging for you and based on that define your path. OK. OK, Sudarshan, OK. Now let's continue. If you are following agile development approach, these are the 12 principles of agile methodologies. These are the 12 principles of agile methodologies. OK, yeah, let's continue now. Let's continue. So these are the 12 principles of agile development. Delivering a working software frequently, welcoming changing requirements, satisfying customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software, work together throughout the project for all the job role, build projects around motivated individuals, encourage face to face communication, conversation between team and so on. Now, if you are planning to move to DevOps, the, the DevOps migration or transformation need to be properly scheduled or properly planned. Now, there are several, you know, kind of uh, challenges. Now, if you are planning to transform your existing team into DevOps, then that transformation number one challenge would be availability of staff or availability of people. People may not be available for you know this transformation. They might be already busy with their activities, scheduled activities. And if you just pull them out and tell them, OK, now we are going to implement DevOps now. So you have to go and learn. It might disrupt the current procedures and processes. It will disrupt their current line of work. OK, because they have to take some time. They have to take some time to do that additional learning or additional activity. Yes.
OK. OK. Now, to overcome the challenge, you should create a team whose focus on the transformation, well respected in their subject areas, internal and external to the business. You can have an internal team, you can have an external team as well. So this is about the transformation. Now, this is actually the notes were written for the team leaders or project uh, managers. OK, from the organization perspective. Now, let me show you something about Azure DevOps as a tool. So what I will do now is I will just open my browser. Let's use Firefox. I will open my browser and I will now log in into my Azure DevOps account. My Azure DevOps account is dev.azure.com slash Mahindra Unlimited. Here I am auto signed in or what we call SSO sing, uh, single sign on. So I got logged in immediately. I never have to enter password and username again, but that's fine. So now I am in my DevOps account. This is my Azure DevOps account and what we call DevOps organization name is Mahindra Unlimited. And these are my projects. Can you see that? I have different types of projects in here. Like for example, this My Shuttle is a Java project. If I click on it, this is the Java project in Azure DevOps. And these are the multiple options here. The first one for the project management, overall project management we have this panel over here, right? The project panel. Here I can get project summary about the project. This is the description about the project, and these are the technology or languages used in the project. You can edit this page and add for more, few more details about it. And this is a current summary, like how many work items in Agile board are there, how many work items completed, how many commits are there, and how many Git repositories are there. This is the project stats. You can see the project dashboard. This is the project dashboard, right? You can see number of work items, etc. And then finally, Agile board, Azure board. This is Azure board. This is where you will be able to explore what all different work items are available there, right? And whether what is their status, whether they are assigned to someone, whether they have completed, not completed everything. OK, you can see it here. I'm not sure, but let's see if you, this project can be viewed by all of you. Uh, I'll just try to open this in incognito browser window or private browser window. No, it looks like you need to log in to access this. Just give me a minute. What I'll do is I will make this a public project. You know what is benefit of creating a public project? Everyone can see it. Let's make it public. Now that I made it public, it should now not ask me to log in because public projects can be accessed by anyone. Can you see this? So this is the project stats. These are the project dashboard. OK. This is the project dashboard. The name of the team is my shuttle team. This is the project board number of activities, pending activities basically, and this is the Git repository for it. This is the complete project. So what I'm going to do now I'm just. No, no, we are not actually going to do a complete project Darshit because Azure DevOps AZ 400 is a five days program training program. OK, five to seven days. We can extend it to two more days. So what I will do, we will just pick existing project. We will not build anything new. Because of the time constraint. Is that clear? Yeah, can you see the link which I have shared with you now? Now I'm going to give you five minutes to quickly go and explore the sample project. There is no login required. You do not have to sign up at all. I'll give you five minutes to just explore it. OK. And your time starts now.
uh, guys, I shared the learning achievement best. So guys, go and redeem your best till the time sir is on break. And put done why, why, when you will redeem that batch. Uh, Archie, I have already given them one task. OK, with the timer, so I'm not okay, sure okay, whether sir. they would oh. be able to do that. OK. OK, no worries. Yeah. OK, so time out now. I hope all of you have explored this uh, public project. Yeah. Full dashboard is not visible. Yeah, that's fine. T -t totally fine. Yeah, I will explain that, Manish. What is the tags and comments in Azure board, basically? Just give me a minute.
Okay, sorry. So what I was saying is, uh, yes. So this, yeah, yeah. I know you have a questions here. What is pull request? Everything. I will explain. Yeah. So basically, let's start with this project. For example, this is a my shuttle Java project, and the very first panel here was the project overview panel or project dashboard, which gives you a quick summary. Now, the main interesting component here in Azure DevOps, they are Azure board for agile project planning. This is Kanban board, or this is something to Atlassian Jira for project management. Then repos. Now repo is a Git repository and you can see everything, all the code about this particular project here, the code part. Then the pipeline, this is where the CI CD pipeline can be implemented. And finally, the artifact. Test is not included here because the I did not use uh, Azure DevOps test to suit for this project. Now let's get started with the board, Azure board, which is basically a feature used for agile project planning. Yeah, I'll explain pull request to you. Don't worry. I will explain your pull request once we start discussing repos. It's part of Azure repository, Git repository. Right now we are on board. You have any question related to board? Yeah, there is a question you have mentioned earlier about tags and comments in Azure board. Fine. You can't see the queries. That's because you people have limited access to this project. Even though project is public project, that doesn't mean that you will be able to see everything. You are able to see the dashboard, Arun. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Now, look at the work items here. For project, all the tasks are considered are work items, but not all work items are same. You will notice there are some work items which are actually. Yeah, that's fine. There are certain work items which are actually test to suit. Can you see this? This is a test to suit. All these are test to suit, right? Then these are the task, usual task with the task icon. These are user stories, right? These are user stories. And then these are features, right? And then on the top, there is Epic. Okay, Epic is not listed here and the bugs. So can you see how many different types of work items are there? There is a work item type called bug. These are the bugs. There are work item types types which are features. There are work item types which are user stories. There are work item types which are. Task. Are you getting my point? Do you know the correlation between all these work item types? Anyone? Hello? Yeah, what is basically correlation between them? Like for example, if I go to this particular feature, yes, Epic is the top one. Epic is basically group of features together. Inside Epic, we have features. Let's say for example, there is a feature here, admin portal. So inside a feature called admin feature, uh, sorry, admin portal, you might have multiple user stories and multiple tasks. So first is Epic, Inside Epic, you will have features. Inside features, you have user stories, and inside user stories, you have tasks. Is that clear? That's the hierarchy. If I just go back to some of the random tasks, I can show you something like update notification task. So this is just a task. And if you scroll down, okay, they have not done the correlation part. Otherwise, there should be a correlation like this particular task is member of this particular user story and this user story is part of this particular epic project delivery is by means of epic yes that's right so what is epic are you planning to deliver certain set of functionalities now in the next uh darshit you are not able to access the board uh just try using private browser window incognito browser window you don't have access to board okay that's fine no worries I will show you how to get the access to this particular project. Just give me a minute.
OK. Now next. Oh, uh, wait a second. Where is it? Yeah. So there are particular types of items here. It's working in incognito mode. OK, fine. Uh, so why it worked in incognito mode? It means you probably already have DevOps account. Right, and when you try to access this project in your browser, it was trying to use your DevOps account to access this project, and then you don't have permissions to do that. Most of the features, but when you open in an incognito mode, you are accessing it as a anonymous user. Yes, yes, yes. Most of the things will not be visible to you, right? Even though it is public project, try to open this in incognito mode or in private browser mode. That way. Whatever anonymous features are available, it will show you that. Yeah, fine, Darshan. So basically, none of these epics and features are actually related with each other here. I will have to find out something. Like, like for example, for admin, there is a user story, right? But there is no related work for it. Okay, fine. I can show you how I can link them together. Let us search by epics. Oh, sorry, I cannot search by epic here. I have to select it from here. Can you see this? Looks like for this project, I don't have epic. So what I will do, I will select the features and product backlog items. OK, so let's see the features now. In the features, you have a feature called admin portal. And inside this admin portal feature, let me add a related work. What I will do is, Let's edit this. Oh, sorry. I'm, I guess I'm using anonymous mode, so I can't do this. I will have to log in as a user and then try. So what I will do is I'll go to the backlog. Product backlog where I'll get list of all the items. No, you cannot create epic on this project because you are anonymous user. Uh, Sudarshan, if you are able to post a message, that means you are already in a meeting. Yeah, so I will show you this now. I'll go back to the Azure board. Work items. OK, it's running very slow. Bugs are different. Bugs are bugs detected. They are not related to uh, Epic or others. Yeah, Prashant has posted a message here. Yes, that's right. Why it is taking so long? OK. OK, so this is the board inside this board. I will try for looking for a feature inside a feature. Let me check. There is an admin portal feature and inside admin portal feature. What I can do is I can add. A child item. What I can do basically is. Related work, let me add either a new related work or an existing one. If you choose existing, you can select which one should become your child item. Right. OK, there is no existing one available, so I will just add a new one. So inside an admin portal, let me add a new item which is going to be a task. Now, please remember the parent child relationship is feature contains task, right? So. Here the task is. Create. Admin portal. HTML page. OK, and it should be. Admin slash home dot HTML. Now this is a task for my developers. Are you getting my point? Hello. And you will notice this is a Kanban board. 
uh, Ritesh, Scrum is the methodology. Okay. This one is a Kanban board. Kanban is basically a subset of this Scrum. So one new item is added. Create admin portal HTML page, which is part of this particular feature. And one feature will have multiple certain tasks or multiple such tasks inside it. Is that clear? Okay, yeah. So this is how you add it. Uh, uh, sorry, you can add one thing. Uh, inside a feature, you can add user stories and inside user story, you add a task. User stories are basically written like this with a proper term like this. As a customer, I want to be able to print receipt of my past travel. These are user stories. This is a proper syntax for it and task will be inside the user stories then. Task will be child to do this. Now, these are all best practices. You can link them whatever way you want, but user story will provide you a kind of a, uh, you know, perspective from the end user. OK. Yes, so feature can have multiple user stories and user stories will have multiple tasks within them. OK. The relation is like this. Now inside these particular uh, backlog items, all of them together, we call them backlog items or work items. All these work items, if you edit them. Wait a second, where is the edit option? Delete. Create copy, move, change. OK, we are already in edit mode. Sorry for every of these items. We can assign them to individual person, individual team member. Right, so we can choose a person, assign a task to it. We can also add certain tags to it. Add a tag. Now, what is benefit of adding a tag? Adding a tag will actually make it easier for to for you to later search for work items like for example now what happens when you are working on a project with lots of user stories is it possible to find a user story by a certain keyword like for example user studies which are related to fair now can you see how many user stories are there yes so you can search by using tags you can search a particular user story using a tag you can even create your own query to find how many user stories are there where this particular tags are applied. You can see these are the options. You can also pick it from here. Can you see this? Instead of searching from here, you can pick by tags or filter them by tags like this. So tags are this just additional metadata. What is product backlog? Product backlog is basically collection of all the user stories, epics, bugs, work item. Basically product backlog means what work is pending. What is the pending work? Is that clear? What is the pending work? As soon as you complete a particular task, feature or epic, you close it and then it gets removed from the project backlog. Now there are two backlog. Okay. Yes. So product backlog is basically all your pending work. 
Then second category is sprint backlog. What is sprint backlog? Product backlog is overall pending work and sprint backlog means pending work for current sprint or current iteration. OK, so agile project planning, you do this. Take some items from product backlog, move them to sprint backlog and tell people this is what we are going to implement or this is what we are going to work on right now. OK, fine. So that's the board part as your board. AZ 400. Now one interesting part about AZ 400 as a uh, learning module available on Microsoft website and as an overall curriculum as a course, there are lots of labs available for AZ 400. Now let me show you one of such lab that will give you a clear idea or clear steps on how you can do this as your board on your own. As your DevOps labs, Dot com. If you go to AzureDevOpsLabs.com, there is a lab available that will explain you how to use. Yes, this lab I'm talking about Agile Project Planning with Azure Board. Azure Board is a Kanban board. Can you see this? All the steps are mentioned here with the screenshot. OK, how to do it? Here you will be creating an epic, you will be creating a feature, and then you will be creating a user story and work item as well. Product backlog means everything. Everything means product backlog contain user stories, features, epic, everything. Product backlog means simply pending work. Now that pending work might contain user stories, tasks, and epics and features. Yeah, sure. It is also available on Microsoft Learn portal. Fine. Now, uh, another way to learn about it is using Microsoft Learn portal. I will share the link with you at the end of the session. OK, uh, now let's move to the next component in Azure DevOps. Yes, Prashant, you are right. In order to use Azure board perfectly fine, your product requirement has to be well defined, but yes, because we are using agile methodology, it is possible to just pick one of the requirement that you have written here, right? Yes, and edit certain details. Is that clear? Like for example, user can say that the details I want are these. Like for example, the uh, you can say the rate card used or pricing used that uh, uh, the tool charges included right etc so you can provide additional details later on yes it is free mayur the lab itself is free because it is just set of instructions nothing more than that you don't need to even log in but in order to practically do the lab you need devops account is that clear So this is work item. You can edit it. So basically you should define everything in advance, but if required, you can go and modify them. OK, if you want, you can add more tasks or more features. Many of the agile projects actually work like this. Initially, you will you might get, let's say, just 100 requirements or 100 different, uh, let's say, uh, functionalities from the user, but as your project progress, you might receive more and more additional requirement from the user. It might happen and it does happen most of the time that user might increase number of requirements later on once the project starts. OK. Fine. So this is. The Azure board. 
Now, in order to get Azure DevOps, you need a subscription. Now, I already have a subscription. My subscription name is Mahindra Unlimited. Let me show you how to get your own subscription. What you can basically do. If you visit dev.azure.com using private browser window, log in into dev.azure.com and once you reach there, there is an uh, there is a small button here. Start free. Can you see the button? Hello. Hit this button and it will allow you to create or sign up for the new Azure DevOps account. Now what all things you need? Basically, I will list down the process for you. The process is number one. Use private browser window. For all the tasks. OK, do not use regular browser window my, because you might get automatically signed in into your existing account. So task one, create a new Outlook account. I, I want you to create a new personal account. Don't use your existing account. Number two, using newly created Outlook account. Visit dev.azure.com and sign up for free, free account or free tier account. Right? Using the newly created Outlook account sign up. So if you have created a new Outlook account, add your new Outlook account here and click next. OK, follow the process and it, you will get a new Azure DevOps account created for you. I would recommend you not to use your existing Azure DevOps account because there are possibilities that your Azure DevOps account is the one that your organization has actually set up and created. And you may or may not have all the permissions required to create and manage new projects. So that's why I'm recommending all of you to create your own personal account first and then sign up to dev.azure.com. Can you do that? Yes, Mayur, this will work with uh, uh, the uh, student subscription as well. And in case if you people have an existing Microsoft sign in, you can use that. But please remember if you have an existing DevOps account, I would recommend you to create a new instead of using old one. Yes, there would be a limitation, Darshit. There is limitations on your free account. Like for example, as far as Azure board is concerned, free users get all the benefits of Azure board. But other services, there would be a restriction. Like Azure Pipeline, there is a restriction on number of agents you consume, okay, and amount of build time. Like I guess around the uh, uh, 1500 minutes per month you get for the Azure Pipeline under free account. And these values might change in future. OK. Yeah. Now, once you have the signed up for Azure DevOps, you will get access to all these features. You can sign in and access your DevOps account like this. OK, now, so this was Azure board. Any other question you have for Azure board? Before we move and process and start learning about Azure repos, repositories.
OK. Fine. So let's process. Uh, let's proceed. Sorry. With next service with you, which is Azure repo. What is Azure repo? Azure repos are two types of code repositories. There are two types of code repositories supported. One is Git repository and the other one is. TFVC TFVC stand for Team Foundation Version Control. So there are two different repository types available. Team Foundation Version Control. And uh, Git Version Control. Is that clear? So why there are two different types of version control systems available? Any idea? Anyone? There are two different categories of version control system that we use. First one is. Centralized version control system and the other one is distributed version control system. Centralized version control system is basically a version control system where all the core history is maintained in one central server. Everything at one common location. All that data is at one central server. And all the developers, all your developers, they just have to, you know, connect to. Connect to that particular central server to get the code. Yes, it's like TFVC, Vaskar. TFVC, Team Foundation Version Control. OK. Yeah. Uh, Darshit, what you need to do is you need to enter the URL as dev.azure.com forward slash and then your DevOps account name. My DevOps account name was Mahindra Unlimited. OK. Uh, what was your account name? Like whatever email address you use to sign up for Azure DevOps, use that email address without at the rate Outlook or at the rate Live, right? And it would be your organization name. Try that. OK, good. So centralized version control system provides easy scalability for large code bases. You can have granular permission control like this is the folder. Nobody should actually go and edit. This is the folder. Everybody should have access like that. Examples are SVN subversion, SVN perforce, TFVC and CVS are central version control system. Another type of version control system is Distributed. Now, for central version control system, Azure Repo provide TFVC, Team Foundation Version Control, and for distributed version control system, it gave us Git version control system. What is the difference in distributed version control system and centralized version control system? In distributed, you get two different repositories a remote repository on a remote server, just like centralized one, and a local repository for individual developers on their own local machine. Yes, Ritesh, that's right. Your account name is converted into organization name. By the way, when you sign up, it will actually allow you or give you a chance to change the uh, organization name, right? But if you just followed the basic process, it should be same. OK. Git Enterprise? No, Git Enterprise is different, Manish. 
if you are using git enterprise it uh, actually git as a version control system do not have something called git enterprise you might be referring to git hub enterprise right yes hierarchy would be organization project actually it is like organization will have multiple projects and organization will have multiple members or mem multiple teams as well but be because you are signing up for the free trial using your personal account it would be like organization with single member one account can be member of multiple organization what does it mean ritesh let's say you have an azure devops account already from your organization your organization has added you to azure devops account right you sign up for free trial now you have two different azure organizations one that you have created your owner and the other one from your organization are you getting my point yes and there is a possibility that you might actually end up doing wrong things in wrong organization let me show you my example i am already member of more than one organization let me show you where i can show you that if i click here looks like for this idea i have only one organization listed okay that's good can you see what happens when I actually click on this Azure DevOps homepage icon? Here it shows me list of organization and it even actually allows me to create a new organization if I want. Are you getting my point? Hello? So yes, you can be member of multiple organizations, but then if you are member of more than one organization, you should be very cautious where you are creating an editing project. Okay? It might be possible that you might end up working on a wrong project. Now, how do I add an organization? You can either create a new organization or ask someone else to invite you into their organization. How, how can I do that? Now, this is my organization, right? What I will do is, okay, it's not allowing me to edit the settings. I don't know why. Let's go back to the home page. dev.azure.com slash Mahindra Unlimited. And now what I will do is I will click on organization settings. Can you see bottom left corner? Organization settings from organization settings. I'll go for users and from users. Can you see there is a button for adding a new user? Can you see that? Hello. Now what you have to do is you just have to enter the email address of whoever you wish to import. Now that person must have Azure DevOps account of their own. And as soon as you, as soon as I click add button, they will be sent an invite, 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 sorry. Once accepted, that user will appear in this list of users. So you can invite other users or you can get yourself invited into certain DevOps organization. OK. OK. Yes. Where can I find organization setting? OK, fine. So organization setting, it is on the left bottom corner after you log, log in into DevOps account. Now let's continue with the source control. So distributed source control systems are cross platform compatible. That means, uh, you know, people will have uh, Linux machines, Mac machine, Windows machine, they all are supported. Git is, by the way, supported across all these operating system platform. Uh, Ritesh, number of free users would be maximum five. Beyond five, you need paid account. Okay. Yeah. 
Now, distributed means you will get offline support. What do I mean by offline? What does it mean? Offline support? Anyone? What does it mean? Offline support. Offline means you may not be connected to the central repository or you may not be connected to Internet at all, but you still have a local repository in your machine and you should be able to access everything from there. Are you getting my point? Yes, you should be able to access everything from there. Portable history. History is available. It's the same point. And enthusiastic growing user base. There are more and more developers who are using distributed source control. Yes, distributed source control instead of centralized one. Git, Bazaar, and Mercurial are distributed version control system. But guess what? Git is by far the most popular distributed version control system now. Do you know that there was a hosting provider called bitbucket.com? Anybody here used Bitbucket? Bitbucket is a hosting provider. And you know what, what version control system they used to have earlier? Mercurial. And what they are supporting now? Git. Okay, so now Bitbucket as a platform is moving away from Mercurial to Git. That popular Git is. OK, fine now. So we have. Uh, the growing user base now Git and GitHub are different. Yes, Ritesh, this is a very common uh, misconception, but Git and GitHub are not same. GitHub is a hosting provider. What GitHub provides you is Git as a version control system has its own CLI command line interface. But in order to host your central version control system or central repository, you need a place a service to manage. So GitHub provides that space. GitHub provides a space to create your central repository or your remote repository on cloud. GitHub provides you the cloud where you can host remote repositories. Now GitHub is not just a place for remote repositories. GitHub is much more now. Similar to Azure DevOps, GitHub is also now a DevOps platform and it has all the features like Similar to Azure board, GitHub now has GitHub projects. Similar to uh, Azure pipeline, GitHub has GitHub actions. OK, so GitHub is having a growing basically. Uh, tool set or features and functionalities now. OK, fine. Any question about Git? GitHub is a storage. Yeah, GitHub is not a storage. It's a service that provides the storage, that provides the, uh, the, uh, the availability, that guarantees the availability, that provides the bandwidth, required bandwidth, right? And storage space, everything. So you just sign up on GitHub, create your repositories, and use it. Whereas Git is a software, that's right. GitHub is a platform, yes. Please remember GitHub as a platform has many features. Number one, it has its own website, GUI, and even mobile app. Yes, you can create users also on GitHub. On GitHub also, you can create a GitHub account. Inside a GitHub account, you can add number of users, right? Yes, so that feature is available on GitHub as well. Let me show you my GitHub repositories. Now my GitHub account name is this github.com slash Mahindra hyphen Shinde. This is my GitHub account. And as you can see right now, I am hosting or I'm managing 295 repositories of my own 
and this is all free account. This is my free account, by the way. Is that clear? All these are my accounts. Uh, sorry, repositories, by the way. Yes, you can link it with Active Directory users also, but to do that, you cannot do that with free account, of course. There are two versions of GitHub available now. GitHub as a service and GitHub as a product. What you need is GitHub Enterprise account. Let me show you the pricing part. These are the GitHub pricing plan. The one I'm using right now is the free account. And the one that you need is GitHub Enterprise. What is benefit of GitHub, GitHub Enterprise? You can manage, you can use managed users. Managed users means users connected to your identity provider. What is identity provider? Active Directory is one of the identity provider. So if you want that kind of setup, you need this pricing plan. Okay. OK. Yeah. Anyway, so Git is the version control system available in Azure repo. So instead of using GitHub repositories, you can also use Azure repo Git repositories. Then we have TFVC, which stands for Team Foundation Version Control System, which is similar to TFS version control system. Actually not similar. It is the TFS version control system. Uh, one of you mentioned earlier. Now, Azure repos provide you both the options. So when I say both the option, how? If you have the project, if you have created a project, let's say, for your given project, you can always go and create as many repositories as you want. Let's say, for example, if I go to this My Shuttle and click on repos, this is your default repository. But if I click on this drop down here, how many repositories I do have? Just one for this particular project. But if required, I can create a new repository. If I click on new repository, it will give me two choices. Can you see the choices available? I can either create a new Git repository or I can create a new TFVC repository. Both the options are there for your project. Microsoft recommends now or, or Azure DevOps now recommend using Git instead of TFVC for your projects. OK, but you can continue to use TFVC as well. Select the repository type and create. For TFVC, it will not allow you to enter repository name. That's because it allows only one TFVC repository at a time. Oh, sorry, I guess you can create. Uh, reminder, Visual Studio users need one. OK, the name is automatically selected. For Git, on the other hand, you can provide your own repository name, whatever you want. Let's say, for example, I'll call it repo one. And create this will create a new empty repository with just a readme file. Can you see this? What is the name of repository now? Repo one and there is only one readme file inside it. If I want to go back to the old repository, I can switch using this button. Did you notice I'm able to switch between multiple repositories? Yes. Any question? Just a minute.
Okay, so what is the question now? So this repos will act as a container for the source code. Yes, that's right. Now, basically, uh, you know, there is a growing trend of keeping everything in Git. Not just the application source code. Okay, not just the application source code. Nowadays, people keep even the application configuration, application environment, and if you are using infrastructure as a code, then your infrastructure document, the document that describe your infrastructure like ARM template, also stored in Git nowadays. OK, so anything that requires version control, maintain multiple versions of it, track the changes, keep it in Git. It's that popular now. Anyways, so we have Git repositories and we have TFPC repositories. Git repositories have some obvious benefits. Now, what is benefit of Git? Other than a fact that it is a distributed version control system. Now, this time I'm going to use a small drawing tool to draw certain diagrams. Okay, ready? So let's create a diagram to understand Git. A distributed version control system means multiple developers or multiple users will be working on the same project at the same time. But then how it is possible then? Let's say, for example, there are two developers working on the same project, right? Now, because it is a distributed version control system, there should be multiple repositories. One central repository, which contains entire project, and then we call it remote repository. There will be also one local repository. One local repository. Local repository for developer one. Developer one will have his or her local repository or local copy. Local repository copy like this one. Not just that, even the other developer will also have his or her own local copy of a repository. Now these developers will simply work on their own local repository copies. Is that clear? Hello? Hello? Now how to make sure that both of them can work on their project individually without impacting or without affecting the other users work? Like for example, whatever changes they, uh, dev one is making to this repository should not affect code for dev two. And whatever changes dev two is making should not affect dev one. Now there is a simple best practice to do that. So what you do, you make use of branching. What you do, make use of branching. So what is a branching? Branch means a separate series of code changes. So let's say there is a parent branch here. Right, there is a parent branch. Let's say the name of the parent branch is dev. Now these two developers will be working on a different feature set, so they will have their own local branch. Let's call it a child branch. Child branch called. Feature A. So developer two is working on a child branch for feature A. Why developer two is working on a child branch called feature B. Now what should happen or what should what we should do once one of the developer finish work on their respective feature branch? You know what they will do? Any idea? Hello? Yes. What is required is upon completion on completion. Feature A. Must be merged into. Dev branch, am I clear? So whatever task or whatever implementation Dev2 has done in feature A must be merged with Dev branch. Only then those changes will be available to Dev1. Okay, 
That's because they are working on two different branches. Now, either you do this directly or there is a better alternative. Now, what is a better alternative? Better alternative is called pull request. What is the better alternative? Hello? What is a better alternative? Better alternative is? No, Prashant, you are explaining me the local changes. Stage, commit, pull and push is the standard approach. We are talking about pull request. Now, let's say, for example, developer two is the first one to complete the task. Now, developer two need to raise a pull request. What he need to raise? Pull request. Pull request for the other user. Now, what is this pull request actually mean? Pull request literally mean that developer two is informing developer one or some other member, please pull the changes that I have made to feature A because this person here was working on a different branch. So what dev two is asking dev one, please go and take my code from feature A branch, check if everything is fine and approve it. Are you getting my point? Hello? Right? So pull the code which I have modified, verify that everything is fine and give me your approval. Give me your approval. Now what dev one will do? Dev one is supposed to give the approval. And you know what happens when you receive an approval from the dev one? Then on approval you merge the changes here now what is benefit of this pull request did you guess what could be benefit of this yeah i will repeat the process don't worry pull request is actually a way of code review many a time it were it happens that multiple people are working on the same code but they are working on a different set of features it should not happen that developer to us knowingly or unknowingly modify something in the project which will break feature B which is built by developer one. So how do I avoid this type of breaking conflict? Because what happens if developer two's code change affect developer one's functionality, then developer one will, will blame developer two. You made an illegal change in the code and because of that my functionality and code is affecting. Now we do we want to avoid that. So what you will do? Use pull request. Now if code doesn't work, you can add any number of reviewer. That's right, Harvinder. But again, it actually depends on your pricing plan. There will be restrictions on number of reviewers if you are using free account. Is that clear? In paid account, we can create a pull request policy where we can say that number one, number of reviewers must be n number of users and number of approvals must be n number. Let's say, for example, code must be approved by two people or five people. Only then merge is allowed. Are you getting my point? You will get those features in paid account. You can create a policy which says that code must be or pull request must be approved by certain number of reviewers. Only then it will be merged. Otherwise, it will be left pending. Is that clear? Hello? And this is available on Azure repo and this is available on GitHub as well. Do you want me to give you an example of GitHub? Let me show you some of my pull requests that I created on one open source repository. My pull request. OK, all of them are closed, so let me reopen them. So let me show you one of the pull requests that I created here. Can you see the date and time when the pull request was created? Hello? It was created January 6, 2023. Wait a second, why it's saying, okay, yeah, now it's 2024. I, I don't know why it says two years ago. Should be just one year, right? Yeah, anyways. Calculation mistake. So last year, Jan month, I created this pull request and these are the changes I added to it. Now there were some issues with it, so I need to rework on it. Right and after all the rework. Right, finally. Another author, let's say Alex 
finally approved my changes. And when did he approve the changes? He approved the changes on Jan 16th, 2023. Did you notice that? So I created a pull request on on January 6th, and my pull request was finally accepted by one of the contributors, right? On January 16th, that means it took 10 days. Did you notice that? Hello? Hello? That's because this is what example of code review is. Nobody is going to accept your pull request straight away. They will suggest some changes. They will say, no, your code is not perfect. Something is missing. Fix that. You go and fix it. Then they will give you further reviews. No, change this, delete this, remove this, add this. And finally, when everything is as per the reviewer standard, they will finally accept your request. Is that clear? And that all will be recorded for the future. So if something breaks, you can always see how it was reviewed, who all people have reviewed it already. Okay. Who all have already reviewed it. OK. Yeah, sorry. OK, so now let's go back. I guess everybody understood the pull request as a concept. I will show you a demo of pull request. What I will do is I will just go back to my older repository, which is my shuttle. And in this repository, you will notice these are the branches. There is a master branch, which is a default branch. Can you see this? I hope I'm audible to you. Let's say I, I want to make a new branch. OK, for pull request, you need more than one branch. So what I'll do, I'll create a new branch. So I'm creating a new branch where my new branch is going to be a child of master branch. So let's create a new branch and name it Dev2. So I've created a new branch called Dev2, which has all the contents of master branch. Then in Dev2 branch, let me make some changes to my readme file. So I just use readme file, click on edit button and in the edit button here, I will just add one change, change one. I made some changes to this particular branch and I'm going to commit this change. Commit means actually if you use CLI, you have to do three stage commit. You have to first add the file to an index using git space add command, then use git space commit command to commit the changes. So I'm just doing commit changes now. Now my dev two and my master branch are not same. There is a difference now. And did, did you notice one thing? As your DevOps has already detected a difference. Can you see a small button here which is saying create a pull request? Did you notice that? 
Did you notice this button create pull request? Why there is a button? Because this branch dev2 is modified. Dev2 branch is now modified. OK, and you have to now provide. Uh, or you need to now sync them or you need to merge the changes that you made to dev2. Uh, you cannot do it, Sumit, from the console. From the command line, you cannot do it because pull request is actually a feature provided by Azure repo and GitHub. It is not from Git. It is not from Git. Git has only merge on demand merge. Pull request is GitHub and Azure repo feature. OK, if, if it is possible, you could probably use a separate tool like GitHub desktop, for example. But then again, pull request will be GitHub pull request. Anyways, so let's create a pull request. You provide the content, you provide the description, and you can specify who you wish to review the code. Now, while creating a pull request, it will also give you a chance to review what changes were there. Like it is showing only one file is changed and only one commit made. That's fine. So let's create a pull request. I'm creating a pull request to merge the changes from dev2 to master branch. So here it is. Pull request is now pending. Pull request is now pending, right? But do you think people will accept pull request immediately? No. Now let's say there is one user who made a suggestion. Use numbered list instead of Okay. Let's say use numbered list instead. So there is a comment made by one of the user. Now you receive this comment. So what you will do now? Your pull request is still active. Let's go to this particular dev2 branch. In dev2 branch, I will open this readme file. Are you getting my point? I will go to the readme point, readme file, and inside readme file, let me edit this. Now what is the change expected by the reviewer? Reviewer is saying don't use this type of list. Use numbered list. Numbered list means use one, two, three, four. So I made the appropriate commit. And after that, let's go to the pull request. Now, Azure has already updated my pull request. So if you now go to the pull request, let's see the pull request here. Can you see this? Hello? This is when pull request was created. Then one reviewer gave a suggestion. Then you made a commit. Did you notice that? This is bottom up approach. Now reviewers show you everything. Let's see everything. What's new? This is the new message. One commit made by the user. These are the files. Everything is fine. Now reviewer decided that I will approve it now. Now please remember there could be multiple approvers. One, two, three, or ten. Now one person has approved. I do, how do I know this? It, there is a green tick here with the username. Let me show you a overview tab. Can you see the reviewer name? Mahendra Shinde has already approved it. Is there any other uh, reviewers? If yes, wait for all of them to approve. And once all people have approved, what is the next step? Complete the merge. Let's complete the merge. And guess what happens now? If I go back to the repo now, now if you go to the master branch, you will notice that in master branch readme file, you get this one change. Did you notice that? Hello? Just
Uh, no, actually there are multiple different standards here. OK, merge strategy is a different topic altogether. Uh, merge strategy basically defines how you want to merge the changes from one branch to another branch. OK, rebase will actually remove that history that there was a branch created and then that branch made the changes and then you merge that changes to the parent branch. That history is erased and you know what happens when you use rebase? Everything looks like all the changes happen to the same branch. So this is basically rewriting of history. So rebase, one of the disadvantage of rebase is. It rewrites the history, which creates a trouble if you are using remote and local branch. Are you getting my point? It might be possible that for some of your members who are using local repository in lo their local repository, history shows that there are two different branches, but in remote repository, the second branch is removed from the history. So it is basically recommended to use forward merge, fast forward merge. Rebase is done as one time activity. OK, to basically. Uh, you know, compress your entire Git history. OK. Now this is my personal view on it. That regular pull request you should use fast forward merge and once in a time you can do a rebase to compress your merge history or to compress your uh, get get history. OK. So this is about pull request. I want you to try this out in your own Azure DevOps account. Uh, I'll show you how to get the sample code everything. OK. Uh, it's now one o'clock, so I guess we should take a lunch break here and post lunch break. I will give you one sample project to work on uh, import uh, Git repository that you can import and try. And then we will proceed to Azure pipeline. Azure pipeline, I will show you. Uh, yeah, I will explain that sample project as well. Don't worry. Uh, in Azure pipeline, I'll show you how to create a pipeline to build your application CI pipeline. And then we will discuss, start discussing what all things are there included in AZ400 as an exam and how you can prepare for it. So that exam related stuff will start once we have done with Azure Pipeline. Is that clear, everyone? Yeah. So now we'll take a break and uh, we will continue at around 1.45. Yes, yes, I'll show you that.
Oh, hello guys. Uh, those who are done with the lunch, please uh, go and redeem your batch. I already shared the batch details. You just have to follow the step and you will get the activated batch. In this batch, you include study material and overview of the module, whatever sir is uh, teaching today. So guys, go and redeem your batch. Guys, make sure after redeem your batch, put done on chat box so I can know who are done with the batch. Guys, still many are remaining to redeem the badge. Please go and uh, redeem your badge. This is very benefit for you only. As it include all study material, whatever sir is teaching today. So guys, go and redeem your badge and put done on chat box.
OK, guys, I'm I'm back. Let's continue now. Am I audible to all of you? Hello? OK, thank you. So fine, so we'll continue now. As I told you earlier, I'm going to give you a sample project to try. So what I want you to do or how I want you to use this sample project basically. OK, so provided that you already have signed up on Azure DevOps, you already have created Azure DevOps account. What you basically can do is you can just import an existing project. Yeah, is my screen visible to all of you right now? OK, fine. So what I want you to do is import one existing project. Let me share with you the project uh, uh, link how to import that. So. From the Azure DevOps demo labs. Uh, I will just pick one project. This is one uh, small demo project for continuous integration with Azure pipelines and here it is. It's a .NET project called Parts Unlimited. It's written in ASP.NET, .NET Core basically. And uh, yeah, you can build it easily with Azure pipeline. Anyway, how to get started with this? In order to use this project, what you have to do first of all, you need to first import the project. How to import the project? I'm going to share the link with you. While you have already logged in into your DevOps account, right? Just open a new browser page and you need to visit this link. Let me share this link which already contains all the instructions for you. OK, so this is a sample project called Parts Unlimited. So when you go there, there is a link as your DevOps demo generator. This is a demo generator where you need to log in with your Azure DevOps account. So let's say I will also sign in here with my Azure DevOps account. Initially, when you try this, you will get this note. It says that you need to provide some permissions to Azure DevOps demo generator, right? To generate a project in your account. Click on accept button. And now Azure DevOps demo generator will allow you to generate this project. Right now we are looking at a project. Wait a second. The utility site will create this. So you sign in and then you need to select a project called Parts Unlimited. The project that you will be importing here is Parts Unlimited. Wait a second, looks like this is a wrong one. I was expecting a different project. This is eShop on web. Let's click on choose and let us select Parts Unlimited. Can you see this here? The second option. Hello. So I will select Parts Unlimited and select the template. So this is the parts unlimited project. Actually, I have imported this project earlier also. So let's give it a different name. Let's call it parts 